Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Please silence all cell phones until after Juma, please. Thank you. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an Muhammad Rasulullah. Ashhadu an Muhammadar Rasulullah Hayallah sallallahu Hayallah Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Nahmaduhu wa nastahdihi wa nasta'inahu wa nastaghfiruhu wa numinu bihi Wa na'udhu billahi min shuri infusina wa min sayati amalina Wa nashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahdahu la shariqa allahu Wa nashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh with Allah's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. All praise belongs to Allah, the guardian, evolver, cherisher, sustainer of all the realms of knowledge. We praise him, we seek his guidance, we seek his assistance, we seek his forgiveness, and we believe in him. <clears throat> we seek refuge with Allah from the evil within our own selves, and we seek refuge uh, with, with Allah from the evil consequences of our actions or our deeds. We openly bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship ex except Allah, that he is alone and without partners. And we open, openly bear witness that Muhammad ibn Abdullah, to whom the Quran was revealed, is his servant and messenger. May prayers and peace be upon Muhammad. So we'd like to thank Allah for giving us another opportunity to be here, to make it to Salatul Juma. And we ask that he strengthen us, that he purify us, inspire us, motivate us, and keep us on Suratul Mustaqim. And it's a pleasure to be uh, before you, uh, this honorable uh, congregation at Masjid Muhammad. Today, I'd like for us to reflect on the stories of the Quran, but in particular Prophet Musa, or, or Moses as he's known, peace be upon him. Try to keep my hands free. Uh, but, but the story of, of Moses and, 
And for us to look at the Quran through the use of stories and to see how these stories can lead us to a mature understanding of ourselves, of our mission, to our community, and to the world. So, <clears throat> the Quran is a book of mature wisdom. And that phrase comes in, in a surah, in Surah Al Qamar, uh, where Allah says, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَا الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ وَلَقَدْ جَاءَهُمْ مِنَّ الْأَنْبَاءِ مَا فِيهِ مُزْدَجَرْ حِكْمَةٌ بَالِغَةٌ فَمَنْ تُدْنِي النُّدُورِ And a translation of that is, there has already come to them the information wherein there is a deterrence, mature wisdom, but all warnings profit them not. And we can gather a few points. Surely Allah speaks the most magnificent truth. We can gather some points sort of as a preface to how we're going to look at the Quran, how we're going to open the Quran, how we're going to receive the Quran. Because right here this is telling us that the Quran carries important information. Right? And that is this information or that these really the word is, 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 can be said as stories or news, really instructive information. But even the term that's used for, 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 for stories is anba. Uh, which comes from the same root of the word for prophet, right? Nebi, right? And, and for news, and also for stories. And it's interesting because I use the term stories, but we shouldn't take that lightly, right? Because a lot of times when we hear the ter if we hear that, if we use that term stories, we think of something that may be uh, something trivial, something that's small, something, that, something for children. But if we reflect, we see that the Quran, right, is full of stories. Right? And in this, in, in this surah, Allah makes this reference that, there's, that there are uh, stories that have already come. But, and that the stories are of a profound wisdom, of a, of a mature wisdom. And it's baligatun. Baligatun. The, the, the meaning of that is, like I said, it's, it's profound, it's, 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 it's mature, it's fully developed. Uh, some terms, and sometimes it might be uh, seen as, as ripe. It's, it's reached in the level that it needs to reach. It's, 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 a, it's the highest. It's, it's, it's really the wisdom, the hikmah, right? Hikmatun baligatun. It's the wisdom that is absolutely necessary, necessary for what the soul and for what the mind needs to deal with the world. And that's in these stories. But... As the next ayat, as the, the verse continues, it says, but, you know, for some people, they don't profit from it. They don't, they don't get anything from it. It doesn't help them. So we have to be, this is a good reminder for us. If the Quran contains multiple stories, right, we know of the various prophets, the stories of their lives and of their triumphs and of their uh, challenges, right, multiple stories, and sometimes stories of the same prophet, right, from different perspectives. So, right, one story of, of, of a prophet will be recounted several times throughout the Qur'an, sometimes in different ways, not always exact. Maybe sometimes in one telling, uh, certain details are, are not in there. And then in another telling, the details are fleshed out. So we should be thinking, are we profiting from these stories? <clears throat> and this is really critical as we, as we talk about Moses. Because Moses, as many of us know and remember, Moses is the prophet mentioned basically the most by name in, in the Quran, right? More than, more than any other prophet. So we should have, we should, our ears should perk up. We should be thinking in our mind about, well, what about these stories or this story of, of Moses and Bani Israel? So there's other one point before we go into the stories of Moses, which is if the Quran and if these stories are mature wisdom or profound wisdom, it's the, the wisdom that's really the highest of what we need, then it makes sense that we should never be so mature that we are not enriched by these stories. So if we're ever getting to the point where we don't feel like we're not getting uh, 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 something, just, just we, we, we're not sensing the, the, uh, the, the enrichment it's not the stories, right? Obviously, it's not the Quran. It's not the message. 
It's us. So we have to become more inquisitive, more curious, maybe more studious, more thoughtful, more reflective. And those are all things that the Quran, as you know, mentions so many times, right? Those who reflect, those who are thinking, right? So with these stories, let's not take them for granted. Let's put our sort of our thinking caps on. So let's go into the story of, of Prophet uh, Musa, alayhi salam. <clears throat> in, in Surah Al-Qasas, and it's... Uh, it's, it's very interesting. There was a, uh, a movie that came out, some of you may remember that, uh, most recently about, uh, I forget what it was called, but you know, it was a big Hollywood movie, and it uh, told, it was an interpretation, I guess, of the story of, of Moses and, uh, in Egypt. And you walk out of that movie, and, and I think as a, as a Muslim, you should be thinking, I need to go and read Surat al-Qasas, which talks about <laughs> Moses. Because there was a lot of stuff in that movie. I, let me see really what is the story. What, is, what should I be getting from the story of Moses? Because people can tell stories, but you might not be getting uh, the message. Uh, it's okay. Yeah. But the message might not be what it should be for us. Excuse us for this. Maybe, uh. So, in, um, in Surah Al-Qasas, Qasas, um, Moses, uh, here, there are a few interesting points. So one, think about the, the verse, and I'm not going to read through all these verses, but I do want to read the translation of this verse in, towards the beginning of the surah, where it says, where Allah says, So we sent this inspiration to the mother of Moses. Suckle thy child, but when thou hast fears about him, cast him into the river. But fear nor grieve not, for we shall restore him to thee, and we shall make him one of our messengers. So, very interesting here. This shows us that even at the beginning of the life of Moses, God's plan was active, right? So, and we know the, the background. If you read in the verses before this, it describes what was going on in the society of Pharaoh of Egypt. You know, there was, uh, uh, with the, you know, the, the boys being killed and, you know, people sort of being downcast as a lower caste. You know, we're familiar with those dynamics. So this obviously was an environment of strong turmoil, of oppression for the children of Israel. Uh, just a very, a very trying time. But even in this, Allah's plan was active. Allah's plan was still in place. So Moses was not yet, had not been anointed a, a prophet. He hadn't received scripture yet, but he was a part of Allah's plan. And we can think of this as we reflect on everyday life, right? Remember from the stories. From the Amba, from what, what are we going to get from these stories? We're in the United States, we're in America, we should be thinking about how does this relate to our story, to our life, to our everyday life. And when you think about our identity, our culture as, as, as Muslim Americans, and we're in African American History Month, we can even reflect even more strongly on the African American uh, experience and the African American Muslim experience. Well, I don't need to point out parallels, right, in terms of the time. Uh, in terms of the history, you know, was there not a time when the African American, as an identity, didn't have the Quran? Wasn't there a time when, when, when uh, in terms of being a second class citizen and lower caste, did that not exist? But the question is, was Allah's plan still active? Yes, Allah's plan was still active. Even when, when we didn't have the scripture, or knowledge of the scripture, or understanding of the scripture, Allah's plan was, was in effect. <clears throat> so let's move on to the story of Moses. So later in this surah, you may remember, uh, Allah recounts the story of uh, 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 Moses being older. He's, he's older at this stage. He, he's, he's been raised up. And he encounters two people uh, who, are, who are fighting. And one is from his cultural group, Right? Remember, Moses was, was uh, really part of the children of Israel, even though he was raised up within Egypt. And then there was the, the Egyptians, so they were arguing. And Moses went to the defense, he got involved, he went to the defense of the, uh, uh, the one of his cultural group, and got in there, and he slayed, he killed the Egyptian. And the way that this is described, 
Moses then immediately, he feels very remorseful. So he's done something wrong. He reacted. He was motivated by something. He was motivated by, by, by a certain uh, 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 impulse. And, but his motivation was wrong. And then what happened was wrong, was unfair, was unjust. And he reflects on this and he gets very remorseful and he asks for forgiveness. And think about it. Think about Moses. Think about the beginning. So he's part of, Allah has a plan for him, right? Allah is going to make him really a, a liberator. You, we, we know this. And he's matured up. He's benefited from Egypt. And he, he's still trying to find his way. He had some wisdom, right? Moses had some wisdom. But in that, in that time, what did he do? He reacted based on, he was driven by really this cultural identity. He was driven by his cultural identity. That helped him make the decision that he did something that was unjust. On the face of it, maybe he thought he was doing something right. But, 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 but there was something was wrong there. He was driven solely, I won't say solely, but his, his, uh, his motivation of his cultural identity led him to do something that was unjust. So we know that he would become a great liberator. But being driven solely by the cultural identity wasn't what got it. Right? And this, is, this has you know, ramifications all around for every human being. Because every human being has a cultural identity. Every human being is attracted to their group, to their race, to their tribe. Every human being, right? Wherever you're from. To your, 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 your nation, your circle, your, your family. But in terms of our human existence, in terms of Allah's plan, and what's really going to free us, we have to be careful to not fall into the trap where we act unfairly solely because of that. So Moses becomes, uh, like I said, remorseful for this act. He feels it was an, un an oppressive act that he took a life unjustly. He asked for his Lord's forgiveness, and he pledges that he will never be of those who, who help those who sin. And then he leaves. So he leaves the city. He leaves Egypt, and he moves on. The story goes on. I won't go into all the details, but he gets to a point. This is a point in, in his life where he was searching. And you see this, right? When many of the stories of the prophets, as they're going through their, their trials and they're going on their journey with, through, through life, even before they get their full mission, they start reflecting. They start, they start seeking something. They start seeking guidance. He was alone. He, you know, he had this great upbringing and, and all of this, and it was gone, and he just knew he needed, there was something else, that there was a greater truth, and he was seeking help. So he's out, and he encounters uh, a watering hole, and he sees that there are, you know, a, a bunch of men, and they're watering their flocks, their sheep, or whatever, and he notices that there are two young maidens, young women who are holding their, their, their flocks back, and he inquires, like, you know, what's going on, basically? Why, why are you not watering your sheep? And, and the, the ladies say that, well, you know, we can't because, you know, the, 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 they're not making room for us to, to, to water. All the, all the men are, are pretty much watering themselves, and, and we're just young women, and our father is very weak. In a sense, they're describing a bullying situation. They're being bullied out. You know, uh, there, there's bullying, there's, there's chauvinism basically in play that's keeping them from, from being productive, from doing what they need to do. And what does Moses do? He doesn't complain. He doesn't just talk. He simply uses his hands. He gets there and he helps. The, uh, uh, he waters their flocks for them. So he intervenes in a situation. Remember, he's out, he's searching, he's, out, he's, he's, he's on a mission. He doesn't know what it is yet, but he encounters unfairness in the environment in front of him. He doesn't have all of what he had in Egypt. He doesn't have all the resources. He doesn't have everything he's looking for yet, but he uses his hands. He sees that these young women are being bullied by the others in the environment, and he steps in so that they're not bullied, so they can get what they need. And then they go about their way, he goes about his way, and he makes the special dua to, to God, the special dua to Allah, that even the, the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, 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 mentioned, where he says, O oh my Lord, truly I am in desperate need of any good that thou dost send me. So it's interesting we see this connection. He doesn't just wait around. He's in, out in the world doing good deeds. He doesn't have everything he wants. He hasn't gotten it, what he's searching for, but he's doing good where he can. And we know numerous times, we know the connection in the Quran of faith and deeds, right? 
faith and good deeds. So he does the good deed. He doesn't just, just, just ask for something. He doesn't ask for help. He's out doing good deeds, and, then, and he believes in Allah. So let's fast forward in the story. So we know that later, that family, the, the ladies come back, and they're so thankful, the father is so thankful for what Moses has done. And they invite him in, and he, he basically, you know, becomes, he, becomes, he marries one of the women, uh, works with the family. He has a, a family now, a new family. And years, you know, time goes by. And I won't go into the details of the story, because you all know it, but then eventually he is called to his mission. And at this time, if you look at even how the story is, is revealed and how it's recounted, Moses is a, very, is a very productive man. He's a productive individual at this time, right? He's out there. He's, he's with his family. So he's out with his family. They're, they're, um, they're moving about, and they see this, this flame in the distance, this light from, as we know, the, the burning bush. And he tells his family that he's going to you know, go. Maybe he can get something that's going to help them, to help his family. So he's, he's focused on some very basic needs for his family. He says, you know, maybe there's a, a, a firebrand that he could use, right? In that environment, obviously you need fire, you need to cook, um, or some, some he, he, the, tr the, the translation is, is maybe some information um, that's out there. Um, uh, but the word, it's a different word from the stories. It's not uh, uh, that same word, it's a uh, uh, kabir, which, which is, is like knowledge, but it's knowledge based on experience. You know, so obviously, so he's thinking of what can I get that's going to benefit my family? You know, what can I do? What can I, what can I get from this? And in that situation, he's called by Allah for his mission. And here, there's so much, there's so much here. So he's shown these clear signs, and he's told to go to Pharaoh and to go to the chiefs with these clear signs, and that he would lead to, to, to basically to, to free his people. So he's, he's now been given the mission. He's now been given the signs. And initially, he's a, little, he's a little unsure, right, because of his history of what happened back in Egypt. And he asked for his brother, Aaron, Harun, to join him. He says that Aaron is more eloquent in speech. And this is, before we take a break to reflect on, on, on this, this is a very interesting point, what happens here. Because uh, uh, Moses, Musa, is, a little, is, is uh, unsure about this mission. Aaron, he, he wants his brother Aaron to join him because of his speech. And, and then Allah deputizes Aaron. Allah says that, Aaron, that you go with Aaron and go to Pharaoh and that you go together. So what significance do we have for this? What is the significance of Aaron joining him? Because he has the clear signs, right? Why not just show the clear signs to Pharaoh and, and the chiefs of the society? Because Aaron, right, his language, what is language? What is the importance of speech? If we reflect on just scientifically and biologically, language is what makes us distinct from every other creature. Language is what makes us different from the animals. All the animals, the way they operate in the world, right? What is their revelation? They just have instinct, how they're supposed to operate in the world, what they're supposed to do from birth to death. By their instinct, human beings, we don't have that. What do we have? We have culture. What makes us different? It is language. So language is the creation of culture. So Harun represents culture. So it's not just the clear signs. Now the mission is strengthened by the signs of Allah, being uh, accompanied by culture so it can speak to the human being, so it can speak to the human society. That's the distinction. So now, and we should, we, we can connect this as we read the Quran elsewhere, right? Because isn't the Quran, isn't the Quran language? Isn't, isn't, the, isn't the Quran, didn't, doesn't Allah tell us that he taught man the use of the pen? You know? Uh, uh, so we know that this Quran is relevant. It's not just about something we listen to. It's about how it affects our culture. Because culture is what is going to guide you
to how to live. Culture is what's going to point you towards living with substance or living with falsehood. If you don't follow, if you don't have the right uh, guidance, if you don't have the right language, you can't create the culture. Human beings create culture, right? We have different cultures, and that's the point. See, culture is important, but it's not just we have the culture uh, in itself is uh, important. The culture is important because it can capture the message to guide the community, the society. So we have this great benefit, and these are from the stories. So inshallah, we'll reflect a little bit more on what this means for us as a community. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. <clears throat> so, more in the story. And interestingly, remember how we were saying how in the stories, sometimes they're told repeatedly or in different ways. So, if we go into a different surah, surah to al-Araf, the story of Moses is extended a little bit. There's more details than in the, the other surah that we were talking about. And so I'd like to, for us to reflect on what happens when Moses and Aaron arrive to the Pharaoh and the chiefs. So they come with the clear signs. And I haven't gone into the details of those signs. That's, that's uh, you know, I mean, we know about you know, that Moses had his, his staff and his rod and, and that his hand turned white. Those were uh, some of the, the clear signs. And we don't need to go into exactly the symbolism of that, but let's keep in mind that they had the real sign. They had the truth from God. So they go to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh and his chiefs, they are not moved right away. They say that, ah, this is just some trivia. This is magic. This is just some trick. It's like, it's a, like a hoax, right? They don't, they don't really see it. So they're, they're, not, they're not convinced yet. Um, and when we think of, of magic, you know, a lot of times, what do we mean? You know, magic is, is it's just not real, right? It's something that can dazzle you, but it's, it's, a, it's a trick. It's not really substantive. It's not really anything that you're going to base your, you know, your thinking on or your life on when, when it's coming. Magic is entertaining. And that's what they were used to. They had a society where they had entertainment and sorcery and magic. That's what they thought this would. And you know what they said? They thought the chiefs, this is the, pharaoh and the Pharaoh's chiefs, hey, we have, they thought they have something better than what Moses and Aaron were bringing. So they decided to have a confrontation. They decided to have, really, a competition. So Pharaoh assembled his sorcerers, and then they were to, set, to go against Moses and Aaron with his, what they thought were just magic. So some Really interesting points here. So they decide to do battle in this uh, uh, before the people. So they assembled. It wasn't just the, uh, um, the chiefs. They decided they, they would assemble the society people, regular people, to look and see who could defeat the other. And the sorcerers, they do their magic. They throw first. And what they do is dazzling. What they do captivates the audience. You know, they're like, wow, this is amazing. You know, they're throwing their rods and, and uh, turning it into, uh, mo making it move and all this sort of thing. The, the audience is like, just, this is great. Then Moses goes and he throws his rod. And immediately, convincingly so, what he throws swallows up what the sorcerers threw. It swallows up their magic. It swallows up that which was false, which didn't really have substance, convincingly so, that even those uh, uh, sorcerers said that they believed now in the Lord of Moses and Aaron. So there's some interesting things to this for us to reflect on our modern age. Because think of the approach. Think of what Moses and Aaron did. They didn't go in there and then to the sorcerers just throw down and show their signs. They had the context of the culture that the, 
that the, the sources were coming from. They saw what they did. It's like, I mean, we're familiar with this. It's, it's like a battle, right? And you, know, you know, those of us that are into the culture, you know, battling between two parties, like in terms of music, hip-hop battle, freestyle battle, dancing battles, someone does their thing, you look, you observe, you see what they have, what they come with, and then you do yours. The benefit of the person who goes second is you get to understand what the first person does. You get to understand the context, and then you understand it, and then you know you can produce something which could swallow it up. So we're speaking so much in the abstract, but so let's get to, well, tangibly, are these stories just about, you know, magicians and sorcerers? How are these stories relating to us today? And when you reflect on culture, and you reflect on elsewhere in the Quran where it talks about being dazzled by things, you know, and that we shouldn't let that which dazzles us, uh, that w- even that which is evil, we shouldn't, we shouldn't let it dazzle us. Where is the sorcery today? Where is the sorcery that dazzles onlookers? And there's a lot of ways you could look at it. I'd say the next time you're in the grocery store, when you go to your checkout line, when you're right when you get to the checkout line, look there and see the magic. See what's dazzling the public. Look at the, the headlines or the, 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 the magazines and the fold-outs and the national inquirers and the, the world of really stuff that dazzles you, the world of entertainment, the world of things that are just so, they please the eyes, they please the sight, the movies, everything. But does it have the true substance of the guidance of God? Does it have what is really going to help that human being, the human being, to live and improve in a culture that will get them to the goal of their soul? Does it have that? It's all around us. If that's culture, the media, culture, entertainment, culture, movies, culture, all of that is dazzling. I mean, we all love movies, and when we're into movies, we love the movies because really we know it's not real, but it's just so great as a spectator. So that's, in essence, the magic of today. So we can take a lot of that, a lot from that, because if we have revelation, if we have scripture, that should help us to know, well, then what, is the, what are the clear signs? What is the way our culture should be? How should our culture be relating us to the world and to, to each other? So... Moses and Aaron, when they confronted the culture that the, the Pharaoh had, they were able to, uh, Moses and Aaron were able to create something better. Moses and Aaron were able to create something that was of more substance. They were able to create something that even when, when, when the people who were making the sorcery, when they saw what Moses and Aaron had, boom, they submitted to, to God because of how clear that was. So there's another thing, too. Like I said, remember how Moses, when he was with the maidens in the water, he didn't just talk about something. He did something. Same here. They didn't just complain about Moses and Aaron. uh, Excuse me. They didn't just, Moses and Aaron didn't just complain about the Pharaoh and the chief's culture. They got on the same stage. They produced something that was clearer, that was better. So for us, For us in our identity, we can produce culture. We have the Quran. We have the revelation. The revelation isn't just for abstract, right? That's why the revelation comes and has so many stories, because people learn through stories, and stories help them create their culture. So with all these stories in the Quran, we should, be in, we should almost be uh, uh, filling up our minds and brains with the lessons of these stories so that we can go out and create and share the stories. So we can go out and share the cultures. Not just the story. doesn't mean we just have to talk to people and tell them the story of Prophet Moses and the story of, of, of Hood. And not just that but that our stories, the way we react, we we interact in the world, they should be like Aaron and Moses, inspired by Allah's stories. If we're inspired and if we're cognizant uh, and we're motivated by Allah's stories, then our culture in the society will do what it's 
designed to do. It'll bring people to freedom. It'll bring people to upliftment. It'll be just like that, that, uh, the, the example of the clean water, the glass, the two glasses, one with clean water and one with dirty water, right? If people see that clean water, oh, that's what they're going to drink. So we have a responsibility. And I, I titled this topic, Prophet Moses and the uh, Mature Cultural Identity, because through his story, we are learning a, a good lesson about the context of culture. So Mo, Mo, Moses, he freed, in conclusion, he freed his race. He freed his cultural group. He wasn't blinded by it. He was able to do it when he was inspired by the clear signs of Allah and Allah's stories, Allah's signs. And the society recognized that truth when Moses and Aaron, when they brought those signs, that righteous culture, remember, Aaron had language, so we can see that the culture was now righteous. This was the beginning of their group's freedom. The freedom it wasn't just from the confrontation, it wasn't from a, 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 a battle. The beginning of their group's freedom, their cultural group's freedom, was when they took the signs and created the culture. So that's liberating. There's liber that's liberating in this story. This can be hikmatun baligatun. Not can be. Allah's scripture is profound wisdom, deep wisdom, ripe wisdom. So now it's time for us to take the stories all throughout this book, put it within our minds, reach out to our society, and just like how Moses showed his hand that turned bright, use our stories and our culture to help those who are in darkness, to those who can't see the light, to shine the light for our society. <clears throat> Alhamdulillah, uh, Rabbil Alameen. Anything which I have said which has been good, all praises due to Allah. And anything which was an error or anything which uh, came out incorrect uh, is from me, and I seek refuge with Allah from falling into error. Alhamdulillah, uh, Rabbil Alameen. With that, Aqim as Salah. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Sure, our lines are straight. Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين ألم نشرح لك صدرك ووضعنا آك وزرك الذي أنقد ذهرك ورفعنا لك ذكرك فإن مع العسر يصرى إن مع العسر يصرى فإذا فرت فانسب وإلى ربك فارغب الله أكبر
سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين قل هو الله أحد الله السمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد قل أعوذ برب الفلق من شر ما خلق ومن شر قاسك إذا وقب ومن شر نفاثات في اللقد ومن شر حسد إذا حسد قل أعوذ برب الناس ملك الناس إله الناس من شر الوسوس الخناس الذي يوسوس في صدر الناس من الجنة والناس الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Assalamualaikum. Our announcement is pretty standard, so when you get your bulletin, please pay attention to activities, weekend activities, and announcements also about those who are sick or shut in. We want to bring your attention to a few announcements that are happening so that you'll at least be conscious of putting this on your calendar. <clears throat> of course, we want to always be reminded that you're welcome to the community iftars Monday and Thursday after Maghrib. And of course, the student Al Islam class, this is a broadcast live by members of the community throughout America and beyond. And it's very good to call in. You'll see the call in information posted. Youth Weekend program, without a doubt, a growing program. And inshallah, we look forward to expanding the Youth Weekend program every Sunday 
and March, this, this is Sunday, it's November through March, 9.30 to 2 p.m. right here. Game night in potluck. Now this is interesting for those who are, it sounds like a single, because it says here that Sunday, February 21st, 5 to 8 p.m., this event is for us, for young adults only, okay? Bring a dish, preferably one that does not need warming, or bring, a, bring it in a crock pot, or $5 for admission. Now they got ages 18 to 45. So I'm assuming that this is an event that hopefully the young adults will come together, get to know each other in a very hopeful, helpful social environment. All right, now a discussion on the heart health. That Saturday, the February, pardon me, both roads are Saturday. Saturday, February 21st, 1 to 3 p.m., right here, the health, te health team will provide information on providing yourself with a healthy heart. The first annual Malcolm X Legacy Tribute, uh, two of our members who live in An uh, Annapolis. Uh, this uh, tribute is in honor of El Haj Malik El Shabazz, commonly known as Malcolm X, Saturday, February 21st, 4 to 6 p.m. So next week weekend is a very busy weekend. We'll try to make this, uh, these events. Finally, we know that internationally we're having uh, concerns and issues, even here locally and even here in America, where we recently saw the killing of of uh, Muslim youth in North Carolina. So Allah, we, we please them, forgive them for their sins, and grant them paradise. And we pray, we pray that uh, this is not a thing that is going to grow where we find this kind of uh, onslaught. MashaAllah. Oh Allah, have mercy upon us and forgive us our fault. There is a European and Jewish and Muslim embracing a common destiny. Said all that to point to this. They're having a get-together at the Washington Hebrew Congregation, 3935 Malcolm Macomb Street to discuss the issues centering around embracing a common destiny. And maybe we can get rid of some of this foolishness that's going on. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>